introduce this next session, which is on Lilburn, the Lemnus, and the Disappointments of the English Republic. Uh, my name is Jane Bassett. I'm a teacher at a school, a comprehensive school, not an academy, in um, Hackney. Um, I teach English, um, including people like Milton. I'm also a part time and full student at Birkbeck um, College. I'm done doing a part of my PhD, eventual PhD, is on the poet um, and writer Lucy Hutchinson, who was writing in sort of the Civil War period. Um, I'm going to introduce our two speakers, and then obviously they'll speak and we'll have time, hopefully questions and contributions. Um, on my right, I have um, Elliot Vernon, who is Elliot's a barrister. He completed a thesis <coughs> in history um, in 1999 at Cambridge, and he's currently um, completing a monograph on London Presbyterianism and 17th century Republican activist, Sir John Wildman. He's also the editor of the book, The Agreements of the People, The Levelers and the Constitutional Crisis of the English Revolution. Um, and our second speaker is Ariel Hassel, who's a senior lecturer at Goldsmiths, and he's speaking on the resurrection of John Milburn, Quaker, um, and he's published very extensively on early modern history and, um, and radicalism. So I think it should be a really interesting discussion. Um, I'm going to hand over to Elliot to start. Um, well, thank you all for coming, and uh, thank you to the organisers for inviting me to speak. Um, the swing of the execution of Acts outside the Banqueting House on the 30th of January 1649, and the pronouncement, as we've heard already, of the first year of freedom by God's blessed restored, see, it's only stolen by, uh, by everything there, might, uh, might have been thought to have been the realisation of the aspirations of John Milburn and his other level. <clears throat> Yet Milburn and his comrades had already experienced the realities of Westminster parliamentarian freedoms. Milburn had spent, on my calculation, 17 of the 43 months between the defeat of the King's forces at Naseby and the regicide in one of Parliament's prisons or another. His comrades, such as uh, Richard Overton and John Wildman, had also been imprisoned for substantial periods of time without trial for their association with their politics. <clears throat> Others, for example Thomas Prince, had fallen foul of the parliamentary organs, barring those who supported the 1647 Agreement of the People from holding office in London's Common Council. The signs were all too apparent to Milburn that unless the foundations of freedom were first firmly laid, the English Republic would complete the journey from Cavalier to Roundhead Tyranny. The English Republic, born from the Revolution of December 1648, that the levelers had had a share in creating was from the outset an internally conflicted entity, created against the bipartisan attempt to settle peace with an ever conniving king. The army's grandees had been insistent that the civilian members of the House of Commons <coughs> should be trusted with the settlement of the nation, yet Parliament had not waged war to kill a king. One of the defining oaths of, of, of the parliamentary cause, the protestation of May 1641, had required that the people pledge to defend His Majesty's royal person on the state, a pledge repeated in the Solemn League and Covenant, the other great declaration, or the war aims were, of 1643. Parliamentarian political thought was generally, generally framed in terms of the continuation of Charles's monarchy after the end of the war. Uh, theorists such as Charles Hurl talked in terms of defensive arms, not aggression. The issues were largely what type of monarchy would be restored and what limitations Charles would face upon the return to his throne. Whilst not many parliamentarians of all colours championed the solution that, as Charles I uh, himself feared in 1641, would reduce him to the status of a Venetian dirge, <clears throat> a mere political rubber stamp, parliamentarianism had been, until the last, almost exclusively wedded to a monarchical resettlement. The extent of uh, Westminster's attachment, attachment to the continuation of monarchy and much of the Ancien Régime that had been, uh, had been revealed in the crisis of 1648. Uh, indeed, Sean Kelsey has suggested that even the King's trial was conducted in such a way as to allow the intransitive Charles the chance to save his life and accept the Doe ship he had long rejected. Charles was acutely aware that this option was open to him. 
on the scaffold, he told the crowd that if I would have given way or to have all laws changed in accordance with the power of the sword, I need not have come here. Charles, Charles's act of martyrdom for his people, he told the crowd, was to insist on the clean difference between the subject and the sword, reminding them that a share in government was nothing to to the people whose liberty and freedom consisted in having laws by which their life and their goods may be most their own, not uh, a particularly popular martyr in my estimation. In this short paper, I wish to explore the response of Lilburn and his leveller associates to the English Commonwealth. Before I do so, however, I wish to survey the state of the leveller movement in 1649. It's necessary, I think, to remind ourselves that the movement uh, that we term levellers began as an insult, apparently coined at the end of the public debates by Cromwell and Ireland. And that contemporary opponents and modern historians attempted to rarefy it into a party name. The short lived Leveller organisation of late 1647 to 1648 was not quite the first modern political party that so excited American liberal academics in the first half of the 20th century, but rather a porous movement of people who could mobilise around situational issues and who had a more or less coherent set of ideas. Indeed, one of the underlying disappointments expressed by Lilburn and Overton during their imprisonment in 1649 was that the Leveller organisation that had met at the Wellburn Tavern in London in 1648 had faded away into accepting the Commonwealth de facto rule. Many of the Leveller's former supporters, particularly Baptists and other sectaries who saw in the Leveller organisation a bulwark against Presbyterian ambitions for a uniform professional state, were willing to accept the new regime with its promise of toleration and hostility to the imposition of Presbyterian uniformity. The greater casualties came, however, with the support, with the early support for the Commonwealth of Henry Martin's circle, particularly John Barber, who was trying to obtain uh, the governorship of Guernsey. In July 1649, Overton wondered, where's my old fellow rebel, Johnny Wildman? And concluded that Wildman had turned his back on the letters, leading over to, to, over to, to say his adieu, and said, Farewell, my Johnny Wildman. In the same month, Lilburn was equally strident. Wildman, he said, hath not only lost all his zeal, but I'm afraid his honesty, his principles, and he's closed with familiarity and design with Cromwell, although no one knows his neighbour better than he. In tackling the period, I want to suggest that Wildman's search for a financially rewarding position, whilst naturally irksome to yeah. Lilburn and Overton while they languished in jail, was something that would loom large in the mind of Lilburn in the 1650s as well. Lilburn was 34 in 1649, if we accept the 2015, sorry, the 1615 birth date, and the father of a number of children. His service in Parliament's army and the political struggle meant that he would be unlikely to return to the trade of his apprenticeship. Such an economically invidious position was not uncommon for loyal parliamentarians to find themselves in. The digger leader, Gerald Wynne Stanley, had fallen off the social ladder as a result of the wartime depression of trade, his bankruptcy taking him from a rising position in the social hierarchy of a respectable parish of the respectable parish of St. Bonaparte Jury in London to steward his family's, his wife's family's land in Surrey. Many in the army faced either a lifetime of military service at the whim of parliamentary votes, or returning to civilian life with their apprenticeships, apprenticeships incomplete, and thus unable to trade on equal terms with their contemporaries, which is why uh, many of the army petitions uh, require that um, soldiers who have not completed their petition, that their, their apprenticeship should be allowed to trade. The material disappointments for many of the Civil War generation were very real, and in Lilburn's case, could bring out the worst and most desperate in Yet, I want to suggest also fuel Lilburn's increasing awareness that political liberty was intrinsically linked to access to economic equality. This connection can be seen in Lilburn and other Levellers' collective statements in spring 1649. March's England's new ch chains discovered begins with the hope that the new regime really intend the people's freedom and prosperity. The burden of parliamentary taxes and its effects on the common people was also a theme of that pamphlet. 
the concern to balance political liberties with the material improvement of the people's condition was more fully defined in April's manifestation, penned by William Wallet, but signed by all the levellers, a protest that the leveller leaders imprisonment on charges of high treason and a spur to the lower ranks of the army to put things right. The levellers declared that the basis of their endeavours was for the advancement of community happiness. The aim and focus on community happiness was more than simply political. The preparative which introduced the agreement of the people of the 1st of May 1649 declared, but it was necessary to prevent a backslide into the poverty and misery that the people faced under the old regime and to ensure the future of peace and prosperity. In the spring of 1649, the level of leadership diagnosed the threat to community happiness that the broken promises of the new regime presented. The hope of real political and social change, born of the army level mobilisation of late 1648-9, as the manifestation stated, had been rendered only nominal, circumstantial, while the real burdens, grievances and bondages be continued, even when the monarchy is changed into a republic. The fundamental problem, as Lilburn saw it, was the design of the Council of Officers' Agreement of the People to place the executive power in a Council of State that would govern England. In such a body, Lilburn saw a project that Cromwell, Ireton and their fellow grandees had long and industriously laboured for, and which would render the elected Parliament and the still hoped for Agreement of the People to be mere ciphers to Cromwell in power. Lilburn saw that such a body would continue an increase in regular and arbitrary courts operating under martial law, the continuation of heavy taxation and the censorship of the press, um, and thus crush the fair blossoms of hope for liberty. The defiance of Captain Savage's troopers at the Bullion in Bishop's Gate here in April and uh, 1649, and the execution of one of their number, Robert Lockyer, for mutiny, showed how determined the regime was to crush this level of critique. The level of solution to keep the fair blossoms of liberty alive was to publish their ideal version of the agreement of the people on the 1st of May, 1649. Setting out a vision of decentralised government based on broad local participation, it was deeply suspicious of the centralising and totalising instincts of Westminster politics, as well as the legal system of trade monopolists who supported it and benefited from it. Historians have criticised the levellers in their 1649 agreement as throwing, to use Professor Ian Gentles' words, realism to the winds. But if it betrayed a certain utopianism, that utopianism has to be understood in the context of the sustained critique of the New Republic's merely nominal, circumstantial changes to the structure of power in England. That critique continued in the much publicised theatrics of Lilburn's two trials under the Republican Book Rule. The first in 1649 was prepared for the treason of publishing pamphlets that were alleged to have raised the army to mutiny. The second, after Cromwell's dissolution of the Grand Parliament in August 1653, for denying the sentence of banishment in January 1652. The central aspect of Lilburn's trials, for all their clever play on legal procedure was the centrality of the jury as the true embodiment of the community. His winning brief in both trials was the argument, defective from a legal perspective, as Judge German pointed out in the 1649 trial, that the jury were the judges of law and fact, the true repository of power of the community, the power of the people. The level of belief in the jury, an institution that looked to an idealised Anglo-Saxon past, formed perhaps the key institutional community of happiness that contrasted with the arbitrary systems of governance alleged to be favoured by the Council of State. In 1649, Lilburn had begged his jury to know your power and consider your duty both to God, to me, to your own selves and your country. In 1653, he reminded the jury that a guilty verdict would confirm the legal legitimacy of Cromwell's military coup. Legal shenanigans Aside, in both trials, Lilburn saw in the power of an appeal to the local jury the power to deny the legitimacy of arbitrary modes of government, including Republican government. That such an argument succeeded twice was the triumph of leveller theory in practice. The foundation and nature of the jury and the trial by peers as the legal voice of the political community had always been large in Lilburn's and Lilburn's thought. 
In England's new chains, Milburn had declared that the local jury was a constitution so equal and just in itself that it ought to remain unalterable. This was to be contrasted with the prerogative courts that Milburn had suffered under in the 1630s and the courts instituted by the new regime. That the jury figured as an ideal of decentralised power in Level Court can be further seen in William Wallin's Juries Justified of December 1651. Written in response to Henry Robinson's suggestion for the abolition of the jury system, Wallin argued that trial by jury was England's principal liberty. Wallin dismissed Robinson's arguments that common people lack the necessary understanding to try cases. In that, he followed Lilburn's arguments in asserting, in asserting that juries were essential to the administration of justice in local communities, as they, preserve, as they served to prevent the law being used as a tool of the pleasure of some men, ruling merely according to will and power. The period after Lilburn's acquittal in 1640, in October 1649, and his stating post-exile in January 1652 were trying times for Lilburn. In the London Common Council elections of December 1649, Lilburn had stood for and won a seat on the city's government. Like Thomas Prince in 1647, however, he found himself disbarred uh, by Parliament from taking this important local office. The reason for this was his interpretations of the word Commonwealth in the Republic's engagement, the oath of allegiance designed to enforce the Republic's de facto rule. When questioned as to his understanding of the oath, Lilburn said the word Commonwealth meant the people of England and not the present Parliament, Council of State, or Council of the Army. This was enough to seal Lilburn's expulsion from a body that had already expelled two thirds of its membership under the, uh, under the Rump's uh, administration. To add to, to the injury, Milburn's election sponsor, the London publisher Philip Chetwin, was imprisoned in Warwick, Warwick Castle for his support for Milburn. Chetwin was a strange ally, having been one of the leading Presbyterian royalists uh, on the Common Council in 1648. Contrary to Milburn's politics, Chetwin had been instrumental in the city's demands for a personal treaty with the king and the treaty negotiations to take place in London. It's therefore difficult perhaps to understand this alliance. It could be that Chetwin was simply applying the old Arabic proverb, my enemy's enemy is my friend, and that Lilburn was chosen for the propaganda damage uh, his election would do to the Commonwealth. That's no doubt true, but political Presbyterians with their views of limited constitutional government could find common cause uh, in adversity for better ideas. A possible connection with Chetwin is through the Presbyterian and city politician Sir John Maynard, who had been Lilburn and Wildman's ally, ally during their imprisonment in 1648, and who, despite his political differences with Lilburn, was a supporter of the kind of legal constitutionalism that Lilburn advocated, as well as local rights against central political and monopoly interests. <coughs> with his ascension into London politics thwarted, Lilburn still had to find a means to apply some sort of trade. In the early 1650s, he lent his polemical skills to various local trade disputes, such as that of the London soap boilers, or provided legal advice in diverse cases, such as the convoluted property dispute of John Morris Ayers Points, or the charge of treason levelled uh, against the Presbyterian ministers of uh, Christopher Love. Love, unlike Lilburn, however, was executed. In autumn 1650, Lilburn's advocacy of the rights of local communities against monopolist developers reunited him with John Wall and Sir John Maynard uh, in assisting the inhabitants of Lincolnshire's Isle of Axa to assert their traditional land rights against developers. There is a sense that Lilburn had not worked out the full implication of many of his causes in the 1650s, especially his commercial causes. For example, one aspect of the soap boiler dispute was the complaint against country people making soap and not paying excise tax that London soap boilers were subject to. A seeming contradiction with uh, Lilburn's position on trade monopolies, but it, it might be seen that, that this, what Lilburn is uh, criticizing is a kind of uh, uh, proto-industrialism where um, uh, uh, outsourcing was being sent off to people in the country to, uh, to, to make soap for the monopolists. But nevertheless, Lilburn's stance on the economic rights of local communities and small traders against monopolists was an application of the alternative socio-political vision embodied in Level of Thought, particularly 
uh, the May 1649 agreement. <clears throat> Lilburn's undoing in the early 1650s would not be his attack on the power of the executive, his struggle against commercial monopolies in the service of local communities, but his particularly unvisionary dealings on behalf of his Northumberland family against Sir Arthur Hazelwick, one of the leading figures in the Commonwealth Parliament and the Council of State. Lilburn's paranoid and increasingly vitriolic attack on Hazelrigg and anyone who seemed to be Hazelrigg's allies, including, it seems, some perfectly innocent tenants, provided the ammunition for the Parliament to exact punitive fines on Lilburn and expel him from England without the benefit of public trial. The irony in his expulsion and, after he dared to return in 1653, his final imprisonment, was that he fell victim under a self-proclaimed free republic to the very arbitrary power he had spent his life fighting. Yet this should come as no surprise, as the late Kevin Sharp argued the English Republic, despite its reformist tendencies, was a political creature that was acutely aware of its own problems of legitimacy, struggling to free itself from the shadow of kingly government that pervaded the English state. The Republic soon set about making compromises with the traditional men of power. At the same time, it used its raw power, both legal and military, to quell its more recalcitrant enemies. The Levellers, the Irish, the Scots, etc. For Lilburn and the Levellers, the English Republic and the Cromwellian regime that followed it was a disappointment. Yet, in his criticism of the Republic, Lilburn continued, at least most of the time, a level of alternative commitment to a communal vision of freedom and prosperity. That alternative vision was to fade under the weight of Lilburn's imprisonment. But as Ariel Essien will tell you next, led to Lilburn rediscovering some of the spirituality that was you. Thank you. You can see that uh, behind me we have a PowerPoint going, probably the first one today. I managed to take advantage of the facilities. Hopefully I'll be able to figure out how to use it. The resurrection of John Lillard, Quaker. On the 29th of August, 1657, John Lillard, being very sick and weak in bed, passed away at Elton, Kent. His heavily pregnant wife, Elizabeth, Perhaps with their three children, was with him during his final moments in a house he had recently rented so that she might be near her friends when she gave birth. Yet as in life, so in death, the burial of this busy man was the cause of controversy. On the morning of Monday, the 31st of August, his body was transported to the Bull and Mouth near Aldersgate. This inn was to be described after the Great Fire as large and well built. And since March 1655, it had been used as the Quakers' principal London meeting place, also serving as the premises of their main publisher, Thomas Simmons. According to a contemporary journalist, as the day of Lilburn's funeral progressed, so a medley of people gathered at the Bull and Mouth, the majority of them Quakers. There was disagreement, however, as to whether the coffin should be covered with a black hearse cloth had been brought either by Lillard's widow or some of his old leather acquaintances. The Quakers refused, insisting that the less pomp attended proceedings, the more opportunity there would be for piety. So, about five o'clock in the afternoon, Lillard's bare coffin was brought out into the street, at which point an unidentified man attempted to cast the well of Paul over it. But to no avail. The crowd of Quakers would not permit it and hoisted the coffin on their shoulders, carrying it away without further ceremony to more fields, and from thence to the new churchyard adjoining Bedlam, where Lilburn's body was interred. The historian John Rushworth later added that there had been about 4,000 mourners, although there is no way of knowing if this was an accurate estimate. This is the petition of Lillard's wife, Elizabeth. You can see it's a scribal copy with her signature at the bottom, 
but it contains the important details about being with her husband during these last hours. She also notes the rented room, but rather coyly doesn't identify where Milburn actually was when he died. However, I've come across a Quaker source which says that this was in the royal palace of Charles I at Elton, which would make sense since Parliament had requisitioned the property. So there's perhaps an irony that Freeborn John died in the former palace of Charles Rex. This is a pretty fine map that I could get of London, 1642. Unfortunately, the only one with enough detail to show you the burial is um, post fire, but that's what we'll be using. The bottom mouth on the pre fire one is the yellow bit, if anybody can see that on there. I haven't quite figured out enough technical proficiency to annotate PDF properly yet. But here we go. On the far left, you can see the, at the bottom, you can see St. Paul's Cathedral, and then going up north, St. Martin the Ground, and then to the west, that yellow area there. That's probably the rough area of the Bullen Mouth Inn where Lillard's body was taken that I mentioned, the Quaker meeting place. On the top right is the burial ground with more fields where the account says that the body passed through. So as you can see, there's actually rather a long route for the coffin to pass and plenty of opportunity for mourners to gather. A question that needs to be answered, and perhaps one we can return to, is why Gilbert was buried somewhere where he did not die, nor was born, nor was it yet known as a dissenter's burial ground, unlike Buckingham Fields. Returning to paper. While one epitaph lamented the demise of the much wrangling of this stout champion, another advised that John and Lilburn be buried separately, as they argue amongst themselves in the grave. <laughs> Similar quips that if the world were empty of all but the leaven leader, then John would be against Lilburn, and Lilburn against John, were variously attributed to the regicide Henry Martin and the royalist judge David Jenkins. His contentious nature aside, even hostile 17th and early 18th century commentators were agreed that Lilburn had been the victim of Cromwellian tyranny and legally tossed from one prison to another. Thus, the author of the History of King Killers, read the title, conceded that he may well be reckoned at least half a martyr for his long imprisonment, trials, and other sufferings for the fanatic cause in general. And every party under that, denominate, that determination may claim a share in him. He having been first a Puritan, then an Independent, next a leveller, and lastly, a Quaker. So what are we to make of the last phase of a religious and political struggle that had begun during the personal rule of Charles I with the membership of a separatist congregation and imprisonment for importing seditious books, and which ended during the protectorate of Oliver with conversion to Quakerism and rejection of temporal weapons? For contemporaries, the immediate question, and one which historians seem to have missed, was Lilburn's sincerity. So, to allay the regime's concerns, his wife Elizabeth personally presented Cromwell with a letter intended to demonstrate that her husband had henceforth divested himself of Machiavellian stratagems and deceitful policies. Another copy of this missive was made for Cromwell's son-in-law, and Lilburn's sometimes much familiar, greatly obliging friend, Major General Charles Fleetwood. Yet at Whitehall, the seat of government, few seem to have believed him. Instead, there arose many and great jealousies at the strange politic contrivance of Lilburn having turned Quaker. Indeed, Cromwell apparently filled, feared that Lilburn was planning to foment rebellion. Nor did Lilburn help matters by refusing to sign a public declaration that he would not take up arms against the government, something that George Fox had done when in custody. For though, Fox, sorry, for though Lilburn regarded Fox as a precious man, his particular actions were no rules for him to walk by. Moreover, Lilburn felt that if he compromised, 
just to avoid further persecution, then he would become nothing but the graces and basis of hypocrites. Away from Whitehall, an Essex-based Puritan clergyman and committed opponent of the Quakers suspected that Lerman was engaged in pretense, insinuating that his was merely an outward profession of faith. Likewise, Ron Thomas Winterton published 13 queries intended to demonstrate that Lerman's supposed conversion was but a mere imagination and quaking delusion. Besides questions raised by his adversaries, all, all Lilburn's old and familiar friends were much troubled and offended with him for embracing Quakers. Some Quakers, too, had been made uneasy by Lilburn's sudden embrace of their faith. And to assure themselves that this was no superficial convincement, resolved to accept him as one of their own, only wanted to show willingness to receive and understand their teachings. Consequently, at his own earnest desire, Wilbur issued a public declaration of his genuine owning and living in the life and power of those divine and heavenly principles professed by those spiritualized people called Quakers. This was the resurrection of John Lilburn, now a prisoner in Dover Castle, published initially in mid-May, that's the one on the left, and then again within about 10 days in the second revised and expanded edition, obviously the one on the left. For the early 18th century Dutch Quaker historian, William Sewell, Lilburn's conversion merited detailed discussion. Although mistaken as to the place and date of his death, Lilburn's eventual embrace of the doctrine of truth was configured in Sewell's account as the culmination of a spiritual journey undertaken by an extraordinarily bold, if very stiff and inflexible man. In the same vein, Quaker minister and biographer Henry Chu contrasted the turbulent partisanship and irritable disposition which marked the greater part of Lilburn's life with the calmness and meekness of his latter days following the adoption of Quaker principles. Yet whereas Quaker scholars regarded Lilburn's peaceful end as a fitting final chapter in the stormy career of a great political agitator, the 20th century North American advocates of democratic government this was an example of the experience of defeat. In the words of Theodore Pease, the warrior was displaced by the mystic. The crusader became a Quaker. His years of imprisonment seemed to have broken Lilburn's vitality. Instead of forcing the world into justice and righteousness, there was only the consolation of patience and long suffering. Similarly, for Joseph Frank, Lilburn's physically and mentally tired escape into the refuge of Quaker mysticism represented an exchange of outward liberty for inner light and inner security. Pauline Gray, Lilburn's biographer, employed the same term, suggesting that her subject had abandoned his efforts to change the outward face of society and that the violence of his passion may have finally found its antidote in Quaker quietism. Conversely, for Marxist heresiarchs as much as orthodox Marxists and socialists alike, this last episode in Lilburn's life signified the continuation of native radicalism by other means. Hence, for Edward Bernstein, when Lilburn joined the Quakers, this step did not constitute a humble submission to authorities. Henry Brailsford said much the same. Moving from the leveless political program to the Society of Friends was a natural development. And so too did Christopher Hill. Lilburn's acceptance of Quakerism in 1655 was a very different act for an ex-revolutionary than if he had been convinced after the Restoration when Quakerism reinvented itself. In Hill's view, Lilburn even outdid Quakers in the way that he embraced his pacifism. And it has to be said that the image of an unbowed Quaker builder 
is, I feel, convincing, since he still had some weapons available. Notably, his spirit, pen, and of course, his mouth. In the remainder of this paper, and hopefully not at too great length because that would be tedious, I want to explore a little bit more the trajectory that Wilbur took and how he became a Quaker, and then open it up into the wider significance of this personal journey. The first thing that comes to light is that Lilburn, as has been noted already, was imprisoned in Jersey. What's well, not been mentioned, but was pointed out long ago, is that Jersey was a convenient place to imprison Lilburn since the writ of habeas corpus did not extend there, and so there was no necessity to bring him to trial. In present company, I don't think I need to draw a modern parallel where people could be held without trial. The second point about Lilburn's imprisonment in, Go in Jersey is that the governor had enough of him and wanted to get rid of him as quickly as possible. This man was toxic, would never promise to be quiet and peaceable, even trying to convert the garrison towards his views. Consequently, one of the reasons why Lilburn was eventually moved from Jersey seems to have been that the governor wanted to wash his hands on him. The second reason is that his wife and father-in-law and father all petitioned for his release. And this is where the image of the broken and spent force of Lilburn comes from, the pleading, petitioning, asking for his release. That may not quite be accurate for the man, but of course it's served the end that we need to discuss. But the final point that's relevant for us about what happened to Lilburn in Jersey is that he was in conversation with the mayor of Weymouth in Dorset, specifically about the Quakers. So, already, several months before his conversion to Quakerism, in the middle of 1655, Lilburn is taking an interest in the Quakers. These conversations would be furthered when he was finally moved, first to Weymouth, then probably escorted by a cavalry troop to Portsmouth, and then finally, along with some bottles of cider, sorry, hogsheads of cider, not different, to Dover Castle, where he was imprisoned. Why Dover, and not the Isle of Wight, where the common law writ did extend to, is again an interesting question. According to Quaker sources, when at Dover, we're now in November 1655, he asked to meet with one Luke Howard, a former Baptist who recently embraced Quakerism. What needs to be emphasized is why Lilburn would ask for this man. Luke Howard had been baptized by one William Kiffin in roughly 1644, in one cold February day. And Kiffin had been Lilburn's servant, and in fact, if we go through Chancery records, you can see they engaged in a number of property transactions throughout the later part of the 1650s. He also provided the preface for the second edition of Lilburn's Christian Man's Trial. So it's Lilburn's likely association with the Baptist Kiffin that led him to talk to the now Quaker Howard. What seems to have happened is that Lilburn began attending some Quaker meetings in Dover, and also that the Quakers gave Lilburn some reading matter, specifically two volumes amounting to about 1,700 printed pages. Now, I don't know how long that would take you to read, but Lilburn seems to have gone through it in about two weeks and decided he was a Quaker at the end of it, which is one of the reasons why nobody would believe him. He didn't spell out exactly what he read, but we know what some of it was. One of it was a work by what he said was the strong and tall man in Christ, James Naylor. It's on the right, something in further answer to a strength in weakness. The work that Naylor wrote was in response to strength in weakness, a work by a seeker called John Jackson on the left. Whom, it should be added, Lilburn said was one of his friends. So Lilburn is praising the work of someone who's attacked one of his friends. That's the man. Other works are 
to by the Quaker William Dewsbury, the discovery of the great enmity of the serpent and the discovery of man's return to his first estate. Those are the title pages of both of them. Besides engaging with the Quakers, Lilburn also had the opportunity to see his wife in Dover. And unsurprisingly, they argued and fell out. We don't know what about, but more than likely it's what's been mentioned several times already today, namely the estates in County Durham belonging to either Lilburn's family or Arthur Hazelrigg. They were eventually reconciled, but not before Lilburn had used his contacts in the publishing world, just to reinforce one of our earlier themes, specifically the publisher Giles Calvert, based near St. Paul's Cathedral, and he'd asked Calvert to band for his wife a similar two-volume collection of Quaker writings to the one that he had been reading, presumably in the hope that she too would be convinced of the truth of Quakerism. Finally, a note in the Clark Papers, these are manuscript newsletters, suggests that Lilburn, by December 1655, was in correspondence with an eminent Quaker in London, unnamed, so uncertain. But we do know that Quakers were right on his behalf and begin to meet him. One person who met him at least twice and who defended him in print is on the right, Richard Hubbard. Another Quaker whom Lilburn certainly met is a man called John Howard. Howard. Howard was to go on an evangelizing mission to Paris with predictable consequences. But from the Bastille, he sent his regards to Lilburn via the Howard. In addition to that, Lilburn wrote to Margaret Fell, the future wife of the Quaker leader George Fox. That's the letter behind me. It's almost certainly a copy rather than the original letter by Lilburn. Possibly in a Quaker scribal hand, or perhaps because Lilburn was too unwell by this point to write. The letter is May 1657, and the subject, it's the lands in Durham, specifically that he wants to get back, and using Fell's Quaker contacts with Anthony Pearson to try and get them back. In addition to his extensive and growing Quaker network, Lilburn also engaged, characteristically, in a number of religious disputations. He began arguing with the Baptist congregation of Dover and published some of his writings to that effect. He argued with a minister called Francis Duke as well. So, What's the verdict? Extensive correspondence, attending Quaker meetings, engaging in religious controversy, publishing, preaching when out of parole in Woolwich and then at Elton. None of this, to me, suggests a defeated and broken man. Indeed, the anonymous author of Lilburn's Ghost on the top there seems to have the character of the man correct. Unbound and militant freeborn John speaking from beyond the grave, Quaker or not. So the bigger question, what does Lilburn's conversion to Quakerism say, more generally? As several of you will be aware, there's been an attempt to marginalise radical beliefs and radicalism in general during the English Revolution. What are the fallouts of so-called revisionism? In this sense, radicalism is marginal, blown out of all proportion by hysterical propagandists and pamphleteers, ephemeral and episodic, mere shooting stars against the night nice sky in individuals' personal lives. Lilburn doesn't fit in that pattern, which is one of the reasons I suspect that the so-called revisionists seem not to have written about the very last years of his life. Unlike Gerald Green Stanley, who may have retreated, Lilburn did not. But both of them died Quakers. That suggests, first and foremost, that despite, or perhaps in addition to, the secularising agendas that we've been reading, religion, of course, still mattered. The second point 
is the trajectory of the level of movement in defeat more generally. How many former levelers became Quakers? Was Quakerism a home not just for some diggers, not just for some former Baptists, not just for some former Fifth Monarchists, but also some levelers in addition to Lilbo? Here, the evidence seems to be a case largely of exaggerated reports. Hostile pamphleteers seem to have been keen on inflating the numbers of levellers that became Quakers. The Quakers themselves were not particularly keen on the levellers, as you can see from the bottom, which is George Fox's, as far as I know, sole manuscript letter to the levellers in a collection, all of several lines. Exaggerated reports they may have been, but fear remained. So Freeborn John, Quaker, leveller, Puritan. Forwards and backwards, but still the same. Thank you. but should go to the commonality of London. So there is an attempt to pull apart, uh, to some degree, uh, the uh, uh, oligarchic structure of, of the city at level of thought. Um, I, I, I don't know why I can agree with that, but I could, uh, <laughs> I could add a little bit and say that the city operates in multiple levels in that you have multiple supplies of privileges. One of the things that Elliot pointed out that this is a populated city, the largest Protestant city in Europe at this point, is that many of the people who members are talking about are, of course, citizens of London. These are people who've been apprenticed within the city, purchased their freedom or earned their freedom through trade. And there are layers of city government, all the way from the Court of Aldermen and the Court of Common Council. So there are multiple privileges to which, in our period, you can add further interlocking privileges through mercantile trade, the big merchant traders that were profiting from the rise of republicanism. So it's not just the city that there is, to use the title of Stephen Mapper, but there are worlds within worlds here. There are livery companies, there are councils, there's parishes, there's apprentices, there's citizens. It's not just seen as the city in the sense that we would see it now. It's, it's a functioning organism. Okay. Um. Right, we've got we've got about two more minutes. So more questions, comments? Yeah, over there. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, Harry, you were talking about the, the burial site where it gets buried in the way of Bedlam, and yeah. a long way away from where, where it was stored. Or, mm -hmm. Could you expand on that a bit, perhaps postulate as to why you think most of us have said that it's why he was buried there? Yeah, why sure. Why do you think it was? Is it because Quakers have adopted him and become a Quaker, is it a sign that they're actually accepting him become a Quaker, or is it self-fashioning from beyond the grave and being a nice people procession with that particular Um Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean the I'm conscious that there's somebody there's a chief archaeologist working in the excavation who's probably answering this very question as I speak. 
and often more qualified to do so. But the, the first thing to note is that he's not married at Elton. There's, um, there's no trace in the parish registers that he's married at Elton. So he's not buried in the place of his burial. You can imagine there's a body that's going to be decomposing, so to get into the ground within a couple of days makes a lot of sense. And you can see perfectly why the Quakers would want to have it at their major meeting place to use rather like some of the funerals before, whether it be Rainsborough or Lockyer, to make it into a major occasion in which to mobilise opinion. But Bunhill Fields has not yet become a major dissenting burial ground. And I don't know if the Quakers have yet purchased any burial grounds within London in the late 1650s. So that may be shortening their options. And then the question is, would any parish church wish to take it? So perhaps it was more a question if this was the only available common site that was left. I, I'm speculating that what we know is what I said, unless we can find more than that. But it is an interesting question. Beyond the showpiece occasions, why should all the ends up there in particular? Um, perhaps so other people may know more, I don't know.
the Electoral Commission. How did they do that? How did they do that? And the answer came back from the chairman or his friend that the city is beyond its remit. Uh, it's curious that the chairman of the Electoral Commission also happens to be chairman of the Boundaries Commission for England. Surely uh, a very happy coincidence. He also used to be the Barney Borough Chief Executive who retired and doubled his salary in Hackney. <laughs> so he's got a good record of improving his own financial circumstances. Anyway, he called himself, he called himself to me a simple lad from the valleys. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm just wondering if anyone has noticed this extra vote in local elections and if anyone has commented on it. And finally, I believe of the 6,000 individual voters, individual resident voters in the city, I believe the Evening Standard once suggested there were 4,000 EU citizens resident there who were deemed non-foreign for local election purposes. So I wondered if anyone commented on that. So as an old historical dinosaur, uh, former communist, um, uh, perhaps I, I'm interested in the history of where we're sitting now. Okay. Um, I'll ask both speakers just if they've got any final comments, and perhaps they can comment on that one at the same time. So, any last thing, few minutes, to say? Well, the, tr the struggle in the 17th century that Milburn and Walman were involved in was the power of the livery companies, who are the successors of the modern companies, to elect the Lord Mayor. The Common Council was elected uh, by the people who lived in London, but the Lord Mayor was elected at Common Hall by the livery companies. And the, the very struggle that was going on was the struggle to have the Lord Mayor elected by uh, the commonality. So, but, but you're talking not about London in the 17th century. It's, it's not quite the same. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do your I'm, I'm quite happy to end with Elliot's final Okay, fine. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. We've got a 15 minute break now, I think, for the next session, so you've probably got time to get some coffee.